Hey everyone, well, thanks for coming again, like especially on this day. And today I'm, I'll be talking about, you know, a competition called the Pathfinder Adoption Prediction. So the point is to identify the prediction speed, uh, the adoption speed given a pet. And Pathfinder is a pet shelter, a non-profit in Malaysia. And I believe this project uh, this competition is sponsored by Google. So a little bit about me. So my name is Tri Nguyen. I actually graduated, graduated in finance from UBC and I spent a little bit more than two years in the financial services industry. I only started learning Python seriously uh, maybe a, a year and a half ago. And that got me into the analytics master that I'm doing online now at Georgia Tech. And last summer I, I interned at um, you know, a data lab of a bank in Toronto. I never did a carrier competition, so it's always on a bucket list. So you know, this is a great way to start. And currently I'm also looking for a summer internship like in Vancouver, because I don't want to leave here again. So, Here's what the website looked like for petfinder.my. Uh, so as you can see, at the time that I took the screenshot, there are around 16,000 uh, homeless pets that are looking for adoption. And I believe that there are only two types of pets in this website, dogs or cat. And if you click on the profile of a pet, you'll be able to see the pictures, the breed, and on the health information as well as the, um, the color, the location, and also the adoption fee. Some of the pets would be free to adopt, while some would cost money in order to do so. So about the competition, it actually ended a little bit over a year ago with 2,000 teams that participated, and the prize money is $25,000. And here are the data files that were given to the participant. So they were given a trend and test data set as well as uh, the other data relating to the breed, the color, and also the state as, uh, in the sense that that's the location of the pet in Malaysia. And also is, uh, there's a sample submission that um, Kaggle wants you know, on the team to submit in. So coming to the data view, each pet would have a. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Just to clarify, so all the image data, there wasn't any image data in the profile. Oh, well, there was. Do that. Uh, oh, so yeah, there was. Okay, great. Yeah. So there'll be. So so for the data, you you'll be able to see. Um, so the data feels like each pet would have a unique pet ID along with the adoption speed, which is the one, the, uh, the label that, were, that all the teams would be trying to predict here. The lower the labels, the faster uh, the pet is adopted. The type of pet, cat or dog, the name, age, the breed, gender, color, you name it. Can you go back one slide? Yeah. Why are there three different colors? Well, I think it's just the way, like, you know, let's say you have a tricolor pet, so that's how they classify it. Like, you know, if a tricolor is, a dog is like, has like red, black, and white, I think that would break them down into three different features. Okay. I guess it's hard to define the color of a pet in one dimension, and so you might need multiple dimensions to describe the color of the pet, like if it's a white. Maybe. Pet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for breed, like, you know, some pets might be mixed breeds or something. Oh, yeah, okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then you also have these information relating to the health of the pet, like whether the pet is uh, vaccinated or dewormed or sterilized, as well as the fee and also the amount of video uploaded for the pet the amount of photos, and also a text description 
uh, by whoever put it up there. And it's interesting because uh, some are in English. The majority, I believe the majority is in English, but some would be in Malay or Chinese. And then we also have the optional data that they uh, actually provided. So I believe that uh, the competition actually provided the photos, the images of the pets, but at the same time, they also ran those photos through the Google's Vision API in order to extract some features out of that. And it's up to the, uh, the, uh, you know, the participating teams to, to, whether, to decide whether to use these data or not. At the same, yeah. Do you know what percentage of pets had this optional data um, to them? I have no idea, but I know that some won't have the images and some won't have the text description. So. Okay. It's the same thing for um, the uh, description of the pet. They are also provided, but then they are also ran through the Google's natural language API for analysis on sentiment. So I guess um, they're trying to give a numeric value, provide numeric value to how the text would appeal to whoever, to the readers, and whether that would affect the adoption speed So this is about predicting which elements contribute most to the quick adoption or about predicting how long it will take for an animal to be adopted? Uh, because I wonder what they're going to do with this that will be, prediction. They'll be used to predict like how, how fast the, the pet will be adopted. And how, how are pet finders going to use it? I'm just wondering. Um, so my understanding is um, by being able to um, know better what what kind of pets or what kind of features um, that would uh, you know be able to predict like how fast they'll be adopted? This organization be able to have a better planning for the pets in the shelter. Like uh, you can, if you have a cat coming in and you run uh, all the features through the models, and it says the cat be adopted in two weeks, so you. The organization be able to plant the food for the pet, like you know, for the cat, like for two weeks or the space, and then it. I think it's a better way for to improve their logistics. Thank you. Yeah. I believe they also can set up. Oh yeah, that also makes sense. <laughs> if they're for profit. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. So here are the prediction values. It, this is a multi-label uh, predictions. So we have five values corresponding to how fast a patch would be adopted, and with zero being uh, adopted immediately on the same day, and four would be the furthest away. So what would mean no adoption after 100 days, and I guess that would be the least uh, ideal options. Uh, when the in the data that's provided, uh, are you provided with the number of days, or are you provided with it coded in this way? I think it's coded in this way, with uh, labels number two being the majority. So yeah, that's because interesting. I think if we go back to the data field, it would be the second uh, columns, which is the adoption speed, and then so that it's it's only coded that way. So yeah. Because I don't actually see the date that the pet came in or the date that the pet is adopted. So, yeah, so I guess. Yes. Um, so to that, um, is there a reason why they chose to do it that way rather than just have the number of days? Like, did people talk about that at all? Do you know? Um, not really, but I guess it's just. It's better to do it this way because if you just have the number of days, then you know you you have a lot of values, and it's no longer about classification. It's more like regression now. Right. Mm, okay. And 
So what's in the data? So there are approximately 15,000 dogs and cats in the training set. With, um, that I noticed that there are more dogs in the training uh, data than cats, but at the same time, when it comes to the test set, there are only uh, there are around 4,000, but the amount of dogs and cats are approximately the same. I don't know. That's the question. And also when it comes to the label, actually the uh, label number four, where you know the, the uh, pet is not adopted after 100 days, but has the highest count, and the one that are adopted immediately has the lowest. So it's interesting. One thing I actually noticed, like, uh, it's quite interesting as well, is that non-pure breeds are actually adopted faster than pure breeds. But then at the same time, I guess because that makes sense because the majority of the pets are actually non-pure, like mixed breed. Um, in addition, though, um, people actually prefer or adopt faster non-vaccinated pets so the reason behind that I could think of is maybe the new owners don't actually trust the data that provided, and they rather have the pet vaccinated themselves for peace of mind. And at the same time, pets with higher fees would be adopted faster. So maybe because people think you know more expensive pets would means higher quality. Yeah, I don't know. This is a good question. If you ha have a pet that is vaccinated, can't you just like vaccinate it again, or like take it into an office and they can tell if it's vaccinated? I wonder if some of these are just you know the people just didn't care that much about that sort of thing, and mm -hmm. it just by chance happened to be um, le leading to like a spurious higher adoption rate. Mm -hmm. I guess they just don't want to take risk, like. I, I mean, it could be confounded by the fact that maybe if you're not vaccinated, you're younger, and people prefer like to get a puppy or kitten as opposed to an older dog. So if you have, it could just be the fact that it's the age. That's true as well. You don't know what it's confounded Which by. Which makes sense because it's correlated to, you know, younger pets are also adopted like, at a faster rate, so that might be correlated. Yes. I, I like this slide because I think this is one of the biggest things that they could actually get out of this competition. If they really had it so like you can predict from zero to four how fast right. that will be vaccinated, that's that's of interest to, and, it, and it has value. But also like if you have a pet that's not been adopted for more than 100 days, like uh -huh. what are ways that, that we could do to help this pet get adopted? And then you could kind of look at some of the results here. That's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you can't change some of them, but. Uh. <laughs> you can change the names. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind of cheating off of the point earlier, but it's just worth reflecting on your last bullet there is that yeah. perhaps it's, it's not that more expensive pets get uh, adopted faster. It's fast adopting pets have higher fees, right? What? Probably. So yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah if, if, if we know this pet's going fast, we're going to charge more for it. Yes, because they probably know those pets are more in demand. So they set higher fee for that. Yep. Okay, so here's the evaluation criteria. So they use something called the quadratic weighted kappa, which I'm not going to, I'm not going into too deep into this, but basically it's the measurement, uh, the agreement between the, uh, the true label and the predicted labels, with zero be, being like just like random agreement, and one being the complete agreement between the, uh, um, you know, the true labels and the predictions. And sometimes it could get to zero because uh, below zero because like um, you know it just means that you know they are um, in a complete disagreement. So I will illustrate that in the next slide. So uh, if you are uh, yeah, for some of you um, being interested to learn more about this evaluation criteria is. Uh, someone pointed out that it's actually the same as the uh, SKLearn, uh, the Cohen Kappa score when the weights are said to be quadratic. 
So the way this works is you have a perfect score of one if the predictions and the actuals are the same. But then the least desired score would be minus one, where let's say the patch is actually adopted immediately, but your model predicts uh, a four, which is the patch is never adopted. So that's the complete disagreement between the true and the predicted labels. And a score of 0 0.6 or above is considered a good score, which none of the teams actually achieve a score of above um, you know, 0 0.6. Like the max they could achieve was, the, um, was 0 0.45. But interesting, yes? Actually, I was, I'll pass it to you in a moment. I was going to jump in. So like actually maybe like worth reflecting on and talking about. So uh, we talked earlier about whether we're talking about the number of days until a pet's adopted or, right. or like coded into these kind of five numbers mm -hmm. and how we sort of, sort of change a regression problem into a classification problem. Although maybe it's more of like a, a rating problem. And then we have this, like this, this metric, I guess, like an alternative way would have been to make the, the, the data provided actual days and the, the target actual days and the error, like squared error or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's not obvious to me why a competition host would make this choice over what I feel like is a more obvious choice. So I don't know if anyone has any ideas as to why you might do this. I just have like a clarifying question. So yeah. is it if they rated four and the real thing is three, is that considered just as wrong as if they, the I, prediction is four and it's really zero? I think or, that would be okay. considered quite good, but not as good because oh, okay. it's actually closer, like four and three so are closer not, to like, like- Treat it as a number, yeah. even though it's like, like a categorical variable. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I think if the, if the true was three and you predict four or two, I think you have the same score because I think you're the That's same what distance believe, away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's like a nonlinear transform on the errors yeah. there for sure. I mean, arguably the divisions between the, the data in terms of like one day of adoption, one week, one month are more meaningful. Like one, like 10 days means a lot if it's the difference between one day and 11 days, but not a lot if it's the difference between yeah. 60 and 70. So I think, uh, I think that the dividing the data up this way kind of makes sense. Uh, it's almost like a logarithmic transformation. Um, so it's sort of, even though the categories aren't the same bandwidths, they're kind of equally important or equally different in their meaningfulness to, to one another. That's a subjective call, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm on yeah, um, my yes for the motive, uh, reason for having the categories that maybe they have to like behave as a company quite differently for a pet that's doesn't have to be stay there at all. Like they just adopt immediately versus one day is quite different for them. So that's why they coded differently. Yeah. I was just curious if you knew why 0.6 was chosen to be good, if there's any, like why that number? Um, actually, I have no idea. I, it's, uh, the math is quite complicated behind that, so I just had a glance at it. And I mean, if we have time, I can actually, there's a notebook explaining how that evaluation score worked. And yeah, if we have time, like we can go into that. So the competitors knew that that was sort of a benchmark to hit before, like as they were doing this? Like, like the people who got 0.45 knew, oh, I don't we, think we didn't they hit knew, the mark. but I think that's, I guess that's the standard for the Kappa metrics. So I have, because like, uh, I got my information from, uh, a notebook like uh, compiled by one of the participants and they in that notebook explain how this evaluation metrics work and it on, it said that you know a score of 0 0.6 or above is a considered a good one so, so that that's for this particular metric not necessarily like this competition because different i would think so scores yeah. are considered good and bad based mm -hmm. on the context of the problem right but in this context it's just 0.6 is considered good mathematically I don't know about that. We, okay. we can go deeper and do that later. Okay. later. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, in the quadratic weighted couple, so what exactly is going to be the quadratic part? So, like, why not use a linear weighted a linear kappa instead of a weight a quadratic kappa here? So, is it because like our classes are not equally divided? So, a class zero is like one day, and class one is going to be seven days, and so on and so on. Is that is that could that be a reason why it is quadratic and not linear? I don't know the answer to that, but I think. Um, the reason why they use quadratic is they want to punish the one that's further uh, apart more, and the one closer would be, you know, would be less to the to, to that extent. So because you know, if you take quadratic, like you know, a difference uh, between you know of two and three, then you know the the difference between that would be like quite huge. So I think in the sense that they want to punish that, like you know, if you predict a one and a three, you'll be punished more to 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 more extent than like a two and a three. So yeah, that's my guess. Yeah, so I agree completely. And I was just gonna add to that to say that like people doing this kind of applied mathematics, basically it's always squared errors, like just by default, with often without any explanation, where as like um, like a an absolute error, like so linear would sort of be like a pretty reasonable thing to do. Uh, but I guess it's, I think it's cultural, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always normal, and it's always a squared error. I, I have a question here, more just like a hypothetical. Is there do the way that this metric is de, is des decided or determined to be? Is there ever going to be an algorithm that's going to predict very many zeros or fours? So is it going to mostly kind of be predicting like stuff in the middle because that's where it gets punished? That's what less? I'm wondering as well because the majority is, is two, so the majority of the labels are two. So wondering if there's like a hack that would and hard code two to some like you know do some data, do some data points given like a criteria, and then the rest they would do the prediction. So well, I think if you're training, if you're training your model with that loss, that's kind of what the algorithm is going to do for you. It's going to try to mm -hmm. essentially center all of the predictions. Right. Um, I wonder if that's like a consequence of this this metric. Like maybe that's maybe they should have done something slightly different because of that. If they really care about zeros, maybe this isn't going to give them the best. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. And like put it another way, treating this as a classification problem, and then just like arg maxing your classes and moving on is probably not the best way to get the right answer. Because, yeah, you should be hedging towards the middle. Sorry, uh, sorry to change topics, but about the leaderboard, it seems that there's been quite a big shake-up, right? Is there a reason for that? Because there's only like a few thousand competitors or teams, right? And it seems that most people have jumped up like 1,500 places. Well, um... I couldn't see the public leaderboards for some reasons because um, they said they were like trying to, they were doing some um, update to that. So is this the final standings for the private leaderboard? It's the final standing. But, okay, yeah. Because um, it's run on the private test set, I believe. Okay. After that, but um, there's a twist to this. And you're going to talk about that? Yes. Okay, awesome. <laughs> uh, um, can I ask a yeah. Quick question: so Do you do you have any uh, like silly uh, benchmark scores? Like, if you just set everything to two all the time, what what sort of score will that give you? Anything like that? No, I don't know. I, I don't have an answer to that. Like, I don't. I have. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the fourth bin. Was it capped? Like, was it? 120 days or more, or was it like 90 days or more? Oh, or more. Yeah. So, not adopted would be B number four. Yes. Okay. So it's considered no adoption. That's okay, thank you. Yeah. So, the twist. Yep. Sorry, I, I I actually kind of feel like since there are some people new to Kaggle, we can do like a very high level overview about what private leaderboards and public leaderboards are. Does anybody want me to kind of describe that really quickly? Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, so 
The way Kaggle competitions are normally run is that during the competition while it's still live, you can submit your predictions on the test set and Kaggle will give you a score on how well your model is doing just to kind of give you a rough go or to kind of give you a rough estimate about how your model performs. That's called the public score and it's only based on a small percentage of the actual test score. They don't tell you which uh, records or which data points they are giving you a score on, but there is some score that they give you. When the competition is over, that's when people actually get ranked and that is called like, and that goes to the private leaderboard and that's evaluated on all of the data. And so there's a public leaderboard during the competition and then after the competition ends, there's a private leaderboard and that's kind of how the winners are deci decided. On the Private just means like this is the final results. Private as in it's, uh, the competition is no longer open, I guess. I don't know if that's the best exp explanation for that. But No, you have the private data, you just don't know. The label, yeah. The labels are private. Yeah. So you, the 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 yeah the labels of the private set are never revealed, even after the competition. All you do is you find out how well your your algorithm did. Um, and so on the far left is a there's a little up green arrow. This is this is what was pointed out earlier. This is the the difference between their position on the public leaderboard and the private leaderboard. So normally you see like up or down like single digits like. The person in first place on the public leaderboard often wins in the private leaderboard as well because the public leaderboard is supposed to represent how well their algorithm's doing. But on, in some weird competitions, and maybe there was something weird about the public leaderboard in this case that just reset everybody. And yeah, yeah, yeah. This one looks like a bug. Most like, of it, yeah. Because yeah. like I went to the public leaderboard and they were saying something about doing some updates, so you won't be able to see the the correct like public leaderboard yet even though it's a year ago, so. Does so anybody have any questions on just Kaggle and how things are scored in general? Okay, okay. sorry about that, you go for no it. No worries. So the twist is um, the team that's actually being ranked first here actually came second when the competition closed and someone else actually won the $25,000 and came first, but then he was disqualified, and surprisingly, he's also a Kaggle Grandmaster. So the way um, this Grandmaster cheated is that, um, in a way, he was able to obtain the true label to the test data set by scraping. A, yeah, it's, it's assumed that he scraped the website of petfinder.my and he was able to find the true label for all the pets available up there. And he encoded that label today, together with the pet ID into a private, uh, an external data set. Um, it's called the, uh, the one that is called the cute cats and dog from pixabay.com. So I think that's just like how they, because they are allowed to use external data in order to add more features to the prediction. So I guess this data set what he was trying to do is um, maybe given a breed of the dogs, like, you know, can be able to tell how cute that is or something. But he encoded that the pet ID and then also the, uh, the true label into um, that data set. And later on, he just decoded them and then uh, assigned the actual, that actual label to the predictions. So that's how he won. And this is how he did it, like, you know, like, uh, there was a pattern, like, uh, I believe that's the, it's the last digit. Uh, the last digit, which would uh, follow some kind of like, transform mat like mathematical transformation in order for him to get back to the true label of the data. And then he encoded that into um, just the ID for, you know, pretending that to be the external data set that he got. And if he does, if you know, he used all of that, you'll be able to get a nearly perfect score of 0 0.9. But then I believe that um, he didn't do that. He didn't, you know, just like obtain that score. He was trying like working his way around, like, you know, making it less obvious. But um, yeah, if we just use all the data that he scraped, 0 0.9. 
And I think cheating on Kaggle is quite severe as well because once found out, um, he's actually fired from uh, the job from H2O AI as well. And I guess like because like I, I believe the H2O AI, they, uh, they have this policy of hiring Kaggle Grandmaster. So once they found that out, they decided to uh, fire him. Is there any rumor that he cheated on any other competition? Like, I haven't been following this story at all. Do you, do you happen to know if his other wins were called into question? I didn't look into that, but... Uh... Um, I, I read something that, like, he was bragging about cheating on other things. <laughs> so I don't know if he got caught with anything, but I'm pretty sure he was definitely doing that and, like, open about it. But that's just my kind of, I, I didn't, it was like a headline I read. I didn't read the whole article. But. Probably over a year ago. Uh, Probably over a year ago we had one in here where, yeah, like it was the same. It was Pavel. And uh, he cheated, but only on the public leaderboard because that was like the only place that he could figure out how to cheat. I can't remember which one this was. It was like the core insincere questions or something. And so, oh, okay, yeah, so maybe you know. Yeah, he, uh, so it was a NLP contest where he, he got frustrated because it was like the year that Bert and Elmo came out and you weren't allowed to use those things. You had to use like old style word embeddings and there was a number of other like sort of things where the, the contest was poorly designed. So instead of participating, he just cheated on the public leaderboard and had a really high score. And then uh, I think after the competition, he blog post about what he, what he did to get the high like public leaderboard <laughs> score, even though his, his score tanked on the, the private score. <laughs> yeah, so in the end, I don't know how it works, but in the end, he had to refund this $25,000. But then this $25,000 didn't go to the second place winner then. It's actually donated back to the shelter. <laughs> because it's, I think, yeah, this, uh, it's, called, it's, called, it's, it's a Google-backed AI uh, competition. So I think the money is from Google. So obviously, the second place winner, uh, the second place team, then became the first place winner, and this is their solution pipelines, which I find to be very interesting because they have five team members, and they divided the task into so three of them would build uh, one model, and the other two would build two separate models, and then later on they would combine that. Um, so TYU's features, technically, TYU is just the initials of the, um, you know, of the username of the first three members. K features, also the same thing, G features. They build separate models. Um, some use um, neural network, LGBM, which is like the uh, light gradient boosting male model. And the G, this guy, he actually used XGBoost. And then later on, they just combine it into, um, they just use another uh, you know, second level model to combine all the answers and to get the best predictions out of all. So that's the pipeline. And, uh, so for the TYU features, they got to around 1,000 uh, top features. Um, surprisingly, they didn't use any of the uh, metadata provided they actually they they uh, they extracted the features themselves, and so for text they use the back of words, and they use LDA for that, which is like a, um, a way to generate topics from uh, different kind of text, like uh, text documents. For images they use DenseNet, Inception ResNet, and for feature extraction and um, for this model they only use the first image, because some pets actually have multiple images but they decide they opted to only use the, the first one. Uh, they also use like you know, surprisingly some external data relating the emoji because I guess some uh, description, pet description, they have emoji in it and I think, I, I, I think that would appeal more to the readers 
And in a way, they believe that would increase the, uh, you know, the adoption speed. They also did some aggregation on the data, like the difference between um, um, sterilized or um, also some interactions features like um, age times quantity, age divided by quantity, but um, how they arrived at that. So I can only guess it's by trials and errors. I mean, if, if I understand this right, the difference between the sterilized, uh, it says group by rescuer ID state. So like per state that the pet was adopted, yes. then they would look at how different uh, yeah. the sterilized age was of the pet was within that group. That To me, that kind of makes sense that, you, that you're interested in what the other pets are around. Because like, if you're going to be adopting a pet, you're probably just going to look within your own state, right? That's true, yeah. And so you're interested in how it relates to uh -huh. the other pets that are in that state? So, right. Mm -hmm. But I don't know exactly what they, what they mean by that. I think that makes sense, actually. And yeah. And then later on, they use those uh, features to uh, run through a neural network. And this is... You know, and also like the, uh, also the light um, gradient boosting model. And this is actually the pipeline for the neural network. I don't actually understand most of that, but all I can pick up is um, the optimizer they use is like the uh, pre standard, the Adam one. And for the loss function, they use the uh, root mean square error for that. For K features, they, uh, the same thing they use, uh, like gradient boosting models. And, but before that, they had uh, done some similar features engineering to uh, the previous team, uh, the, uh, the previous models. But also at the same time, they used uh, doc to vec in order to transform the text documents, uh, the, you know, the text description into numeric uh, numbers for for the features, and also they use, um, uh, for images, they uh, use a pre-trained neural network um, from some other guy on Kaggle as well. And um, that's, how they extract, uh, that's how they extracted the, the features for the images. So the way LGBM works is that it grows vertically by selecting the leaf with max loss and try to improve on that. So the benefit for that is that it's actually, um, it focuses on, it's highly focuses on accuracy and results. And at the same time, it's also very efficient on large data sets. However, it's not recommended on small data sets because it, uh, the major problem with this is overfitting. Questions? For the last model, like something really interesting that I, um, I, I came to learn as well, and it's pretty new to me, is something called the adversarial validation. And apparently that is useful when the training data and the test data are completely different in terms of the population they're derived from. So uh, how adversarial validation works is that it's actually um, you build a classification model on both training and, data and testing data, and that model would try to predict which one is um, the trend, training data and which one is the testing data. And it would be able to pick out uh, the ones that, uh, the data points that are not um, the same as the test, test data in order to make, uh, so the idea is to, I think, to have a validation data set that would closely represent the test data so that it'll be able to tell you like how well the model performed, like how well the model performed on the validation would be a good proxy to how well the model performed to the test data as well. Yeah, I'm just trying to wrap my heading around this. I kind of have an open question. Why would you not want to do this on a set where you like what if you just don't know what your test set is going to be would you want to try to perform adversarial validation 
like in the real I, world? Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the uh, discussion I think it's worth bringing up as well because that's my question as well, and that's one of the key takeaways because that's the thing about Kaggle and you know like how that works. And so I'm wondering like how valid this would this method would be in the real world where you don't actually know the test data. I got a question. I mean, probably for you or anyone that who are expert in a Kaggle, uh, is there any guarantee that the test data and the training data, the basic the available data and the test data come from the same population, same from distribution? Because otherwise, the results can be uh, can you know go to the chance the the first the the person who goes uh, become the first may not be the you know the the best results, it just comes from the chance. It's like definitely it. possible and does happen in Kaggle that the populations are derived or pulled from different sets. Um, but I would, I would maybe push back and say that, that the person that came in first actually maybe still accounted for that and did a, a better job than everybody else at making sure that their models were general. Um, or generalized. I mean, if it's not a guarantee that the same distribution, I'm very you know, cautious about that. Yeah, so uh, Kaggle basically never guarantees that they're the same. I think it's almost always assumed that they are, and that's a largely safe assumption, although there are competitions where there's a, a gap. I mean, we actually saw that earlier here, right? I mean, we have a different cat-dog split in the train and the test data, and I would take that like very suspiciously. Like, uh, you know, the natural thing to do is just a random split of your data, and that was never going to happen by chance, what we saw there. So something's happening. Maybe they, like, maybe it was just stratification when they split the data that still would create, like, a train test difference, but it's not, like, different websites or something. Um, and, yeah, that could skew the results. Although, yeah, I agree. Generally speaking, somehow the, the model that did best on the train data still does the best on the test data, even when there's a gap. Um, and then uh, talking about the real world from earlier, uh, so a common or at least reasonable scenario in the real world would be that I have data that I know to be representative of my test data, and I have data that I know to be a bit different. They, may be, they somehow came from two different sources, maybe from different periods in time where there was change in the data generation process, or maybe in computer vision I have like external data, which I know it's like, it's photos of dogs, but they're like, you know, taken from Instagram rather than from PetFinder. Uh, and so, you know, you, you almost always will want to, you know, be testing on data that you know to be representative. Uh, you might like to be training on it as well, but you know, you could somehow get extra signal from this data that you know is slightly different. And then you would use this maybe adversarial validation to sort of pick features because like if, if it's a feature that is like very strongly indicate, like you can use it to tell whether this is a like a, a, a train or a test image, then that probably means that it's it's like it's very different. Like and so like if you if you use that to predict things like adoption, you're gonna be sort of um, like learning features for that other distribution rather than your target distribution. So, so I think this is like actually a very reasonable real-world scenario. Mm -hmm, I see. So in a sense, like you don't have your test data, but you should always have like a sample, a representative sample. If you don't and you're doing ML, then you're in big trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then after they have all the predictions from the three models that, uh, you know, they divided the team into building, um, the final step would be the ensampling or stacking step where they use the risk regression. So the basic idea of this is to build a second uh, level models that combines the powers of all the, uh, you know, the first level models together in order to have a better prediction um, values. So for example, that some models would do well, some models would do well in, um, were for certain data, and um, some would do well on the others. And the point of a stacking step is to combine all the areas that they do well together in order to have uh, more powerful predictions.
And in the final step, I guess it's just the uh, it's just like tuning the threshold uh, in order to turn on these prediction values into a discrete value from zero to four. And it's interesting. Why is it interesting to me is that they actually borrow the idea from a team that plays for 548. And um, I guess that's the uh, collaboration, I, uh, you know, spirit of Kaggle, that uh, people would just publish their, uh, you know, notebooks on something, and then you know, uh, other teams can actually look into that and adopt the idea as well. And here is the um, yeah. This is what the uh, you know the uh, the stack of the second team, uh, second place team looked like, and um, they actually use quite a similar stack to their first place team, except that they they also use cat boost, which the first team did not use, and also they also use the optional text and image data. So it sounds like the teams that placed first and second maybe both didn't use the metadata. Did you did you look into this one solution at all about the like Google sentiment data for the text? Oh no, I didn't. Okay, yeah. it would be very curious. I'd be I'm very curious uh, whether that was kind of just like a you know not useful for predictions and it was kind of just like a decoy. Uh, I kind of think it's a little irresponsible for them to just give people this data that might not be predictive at all because you may get a lot of teams that are really trying to take advantage of this and, and end up wasting a lot of time. Yeah, well, I guess because it's sponsored by Google, so in a way they want to, I think they, want, they wanted to put it out there, but then if you know, the first place and second place team ended up not using any of that, that would be quite a setback. So yes, like uh, as discussed earlier, it's like you know the the takeaways from this is that you know the adversarial validation work because the test set is known. So what if the test set is not known? So it's Kaggle versus the real world, which um, Alexi actually explained a bit on that, and it actually makes sense now. Also, the majority of the labels are two. So I was actually wondering if there's any possible hack. To hard code, like just like you know, label two for some data point, which I believe that's how um, that's how the uh, you know the the disqualified grandmaster cheated by using only a few percentage of the uh, true labels that he uh, scraped from the website, and at the same time he also hard coded like two into like the the, the remaining of the data. And yes, feature engineering is the key, and also collaborating and learning from other teams goes a long way as well. So, um, yeah, and also the first place team, I, I guess they do well because they actually worked on the, the problem at the cat cafe. So, you know, and yeah, it's just a joke. Oh, no, I didn't participate in that. Yes. Oh yeah, for sure. Why would the different competition be able to block the competition to close and therefore be able to block the available ones? Yeah, so the question was if it's possible to look at the look at the notebook of the winning solution. Mm -hmm. Yes, so actually the, the winning team the winning team they did a summary of their solution. I've never actually tried that. Hmm. Oh no, it's like uh, you know Windows and Mac again. I don't think we know, <laughs> but we can we can kind of uh, yeah we can we can. 
kind of wrap things up and take any additional questions and then kind of keep doing this uh, okay. as well. Okay, yep. So that, I guess that was the entry of the presentation? Yeah. That's it. Uh, any questions? Actually, I sort of have like a public private question for the doctor sitting next to me. You seem like relatively familiar with the Kappa. Is this, is this the kind of, it comes up a lot, does it? In psychology research as well, it's just a general use metric for other purposes. Um, so if you have a rating uh, on a scale or something and you or one person is rating it, another person is rating it, you can use it as an inter-rater reliability metric to see if like if your rating is still consistent when different people are doing it. So yeah, it's used for other other purposes. Other mm -hmm. And and some of those would be like maybe subjective purposes, like like rating my pain or my anxiety or something. Yeah. So you have like one rater is asking a patient about some uh, getting some sort of value from their answer to a question and you're trying to see if when another person does it, are they getting the same answer? Hello. Yeah. Uh, so here we are not considering the uh, any of the image data, right? So in a real world situation, um, say if there is like ten images of the same dog, so the probability of me adopting the dog would be more. So is it? I don't know why it's not a good idea to consider the image data at all, at least the number of images. So in, in both the first and the, I mean, whatever we walked through, so you said like the image data has been ignored. They're not considered. They, they, they use them for feature extraction. So, but yes, uh, some only use the first images. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, and but then they're like also like, um, um, the other parts of the team, I forgot to mention, they 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 use all the images. So, oh. so it's just I think it's just their um, the preference and how well the mo that would help with their model. It's it's logistically difficult to utilize like many images. So you know, like if I if I have one image and I use a neural network to extract features from it, like that's one thing. <coughs> But like, if some of my dogs have one image and some of my dogs have 19 images, like, what do I do with these 19 vectors? Do I like average them? I mean, you could, but like, an average of 19 vectors looks way different from like one vector. I mean, they're yeah. they're the same shape, right? But their context meaning is going to be very different. And so, like, I think I think that's just like a challenge. Uh, you'd have a reasonable domain hypothesis that the first image, you know, the cover image or something, is somehow the best or most relevant or most prominent in the website. So that's a good choice. Um, like, I think if I were going to use all of them, I might kind of like do a, like an outer join, so to speak, between the images and the rows. And so I would treat each of the images as like a separate record that happened to have all the other data the same. Uh, that would be an option. Uh, but at least the number of images, is that considered here? I think that was in there. Yeah. Okay. The number of images? Uh, yes, I think that's like how, uh, if I go back here, I think they some. So, yes. So, you know, like uh, they actually, uh, the first place team, they utilize that in the interactions features with like the photo amount, which is okay. the. Yeah number of uh, images that the pet come with. So could I just, I mean, this might be a question for people who've done NLP in their room, but it's come across a technique where you do do averaging of word embeddings, where you can sort of just basically sum them together with the idea that it's a, it's a large dimensional space and more often than not, you'll probably be more or less orthogonal, you know, if, as long as the number of vectors is less, much less than the size of your dimension. It, can you do the same kind of thing here, or do you have an insight? Or I have one comment, and that 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 is yes, it is something that is used, and it's annoyingly a hard uh, approach to beat um, because it's. I mean, you're obviously losing so much information when you do that that I think nobody really likes to take this approach. But in NLP, it is actually one of like the, the more difficult things to beat for. 
I don't think you just. I don't think you often encounter multiple images describing one thing, and so it's just. I mean, with words, I mean, it's it's. It was one of the only ways of combining the word vectors together. Is like, okay, let's just average them. But yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let's. Oh yeah, there's uh, another one. Do you know which uh, like breeds were the most popular that got adopted? It's um, mixed breed, so oh. so that's the uh, majority of, of them on there. <laughs> uh, what? Sorry. That's the majority mixed breed, oh. but you know, I'm, I'm yeah. That's why I'm wondering, like you know, if there's like a way to cheat, like you know, if it's a Shiba, this would be like immediate zero, like the label, immediate adoption. So. Maybe it makes sense for you know to look at the breed as well and you know to break them down. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. How cute the breed is. Thank you.